I think it was opportunistic. I think it was in a moment of high rage. Information no one had except the person who must have put that knife inside of her. He had 45 bullets in his body. The intent was clearly to kill those officers and those first responders. The reason we've been so successful with the police is because we target on the prolific offenders. And it's a matter of building a mountain of evidence. He is a man who will never again walk the streets of this city or any community. Hello, I'm Dan Satterberg. Welcome to the Prosecutor's Post, where we take a closer look at the issues impacting criminal justice. We also introduce you to some of the men and women who work for justice every day. You know, when someone is victimized by crime, it can be a harrowing experience, not only for them, but for their families and their friends as well. Jenny Whelan is the director of a nonprofit group called Family and Friends of Violent Crime Victims. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your organization? Families and Friends was started by 13 families back in February of 1975 when many um, young women were missing. They were later found murdered and they were really a grassroots organization that had two uh, foundations. One was to study the criminal justice system, to have people come into the community, to let other citizens be educated and for peer support. And today we are still serving crime victims in, in 10 counties throughout Puget Sound. It's your 36th birthday this year. Yes. You know, people don't wake up one day and think, oh, I'm going to be involved in the criminal justice system. When you're victims, it happens out of the blue like a bolt of lightning, uh, and all of a sudden your life is turned upside down. I know that you have a personal story about how you got involved in this line of work. Can you tell us? In November of 1992, my 17-year-old daughter and only child, Amy, was murdered by uh, another person in Everett, Washington. Friday before Thanksgiving, I never ever thought that I could be, happen to my daughter or to me, and it literally shattered my world. The Snohomish County Prosecutor's Office referred me to families and friends, and they were so helpful. And again, it's the worst way to become involved, but I know that the work that families and friends is does is so important and I'm really living proof of what can happen when families receive services. And the work you do continues to honor Amy every day. Now, how much did you know about the criminal justice system before your own personal tragedy? I didn't know anything. I had never even been in a courthouse before then and to hear about the different types of hearings and guilty pleas and all that was so confusing. Fortunately, I had a great victim advocate from Families and Friends and also from the prosecutor's office that explained that. What is it that victims need most when something terrible happens and all of a sudden they are involuntarily part of this massive and, and sort of mysterious system? We really offer them emotional support as they go through the criminal justice system and explain to them from the beginning to the end. We also tell them that they, that when someone says that a trial may start in 90 days, that it most likely will not. And it can go on for a long time. And so we are there from the beginning when we are contacted too long after the criminal justice process is finished. Now, do you charge for your services? Our services are at no cost to the victims served. How do you do that? We rely on uh, generous donors, uh, special events, and federal funding from the Victims of Crime Act. So in addition to being with a family who's lost a loved one or an actual victim who's been a victim of, of a violent crime, um, do you provide other sort of peer support or counseling services? We have a 24-hour crisis line and one-on-one -on -one crisis um, intervention. We also will meet with clients and we have a peer support system. Sometimes we're asked to do media intervention if it's a high-profile case and the family doesn't wish to speak to the press, we will um, run interference for them. 
We also are willing to, you know, set up a time that they can speak to the press at their, at their timing and not the press's. So you're there with instant support that's going to last for as long as that case lasts or, or even longer. Or even longer. What are some of the things that you think the criminal justice system does well with victims? Uh, and some, maybe some of the things that have changed since you first got involved. I think that we have seen sentences be more in line with the crime. I know that a lot of people are shocked when they find out that first degree murder does not mean a life sentence. I think that um, in 1997 when first degree manslaughter was uh, increased and in the sentencing for second degree murder because the crimes is often a fluidity through the thought process. And so I think that with the victim witness advocates being there also to help explain the process, I, we find that more and more prosecutors are inviting families and friends to come in and meet with families for the first time so they know that there is a safety net and additional resources for them to have. So w w people in the system are remembering to include the victims and to include a victim advocate as well as part of that package. Right. Where do you think we have room to improve in the criminal justice system? Where do we, where do we let people down? I think one of the things is, is finding a safe place when um, victims or witnesses are going to court, that oftentimes there isn't a place for them in some courthouses, and that especially when you're talking about a, a, a violent crime that's been caused due to gang violence, that there can be a lot of apprehension and um, People are, can be scared and maybe not even wish to participate. So I think that, that that is, and always, you know, remembering that victims' input is valuable to the prosecution, that if victims um, are cooperative, they have, there's a better chance of, see, of getting a conviction, both with law enforcement and prosecution. So I think that there's been a lot of work, especially in the state of Washington, working with uh, the prosecutors on ways to make the system more victim-centered. It's about dignity and respect. It is, really, about treating victims with dignity and respect no matter their socioeconomic background or, or any other issues that um, this happened through no fault of their own and and that um, they deserve that. One phenomenon that I've noticed over the years is that when a terrible crime happens, there's initially interest in the victim, the victim's family, the impact of that loss, but as time goes on and the trial maybe is a year or even two years out, the focus now is on the defendant and about this person's needs or their deficiencies in their upbringing or something. And how do we get that focus back on the initial sympathy for the victim and their family? I think it's something that we continually need to work on with um, not only with the prosecutor's office but with the media of, of having the victim's families maybe being able to give a story about what the victim was like and, and a picture of them when they were, you know, in their prime. I think that families um, feel that too, that all of a sudden they're just an onlooker um, to what's happening and that it does center around the offender. I think that, you know, so many cases that we can remember who the defendant was, but if we try to remember the names of the victims, you know, it's not easy. Recently, your organization uh, helped the victim's family uh, on the, the 49th victim of Gary Ridgway, and I'm sorry to bring up his name. We do remember his name. But Becky Marrero was a 20-year-old girl who was killed in 1982, and it took 20 years to solve the mystery of, of her death. Um, to tell, tell us, without revealing client confidences, what does a family like hers need now to, to revisit uh, that, that history, which is ancient history for us, but which is a fresh wound still for them? Well, f you know, for instance, some uh, times families believe that their loved one is going to walk through the door, and so then finding out that 
indeed their loved one's been identified after 28 years. You know, that is such a shock to the system. You know, when sometimes when things first happen, you have that, whether what no matter what the crime is, you have that shock that somehow bars a lot of emotional feelings and that, in, you know, in this case, there's no insulation. You know, you're hit with this with, you know, almost at Christmas time. Right. Um, and then, you know, does, what, what do you do? What kind of a service do you have? How do you get out about um, Becky as a person rather than perhaps that she lived a high risk lifestyle? Right. To, and I know that's one thing that um, your office really helped with. Um, Dan was getting that mug shot off of the papers as a, as a, f a you know file photo and putting one with Becky and her and her two year old daughter. She was a beautiful young woman with a young daughter and had a lot of hope and for the for the future and and that tragic crime stole all of that from her and from her daughter and her family and uh, I know that your you, know, you were there and and uh, your other advocates were there to help them maintain some dignity and respect because for some of us 28 years ago is a long time ago for them it brought everything back to the surface like it just happened yesterday didn't it right and it did happen quickly you know the Becky's remains were found just a couple days before Christmas and then Ridgeway um, was arraigned and sentenced on the 18th of February so within a matter of seven weeks there was a lot of um, issues that came up for that family I bet you heard some people say, well, this should bring some closure. What do you think of the word closure? I think no matter what the crime is, that there is not closure. I think that's a term that is used very loosely. Both, you know, could be used by anybody, whether it's a community member or a friend, the press. They say, well, now that the trial's over, there's closure. Or in a case where somebody's been missing, and then the remains, it, there's closure. I think that um, there is never closure for victims because each day, whether you are a survivor of a crime, you think about that crime. It doesn't ever, it's not like a, uh, someone has the flu or a illness that they get over, it's there. You learn how to cope with that and integrate that crime into your life and you learn coping tools. But there is no thing, such thing as closure, and it would just would be wonderful to be able to educate people so about we that. We don't throw that word around loosely because it, it kind of puts an unfair burden on victims who probably think, well, I'm supposed to feel closure, but I don't. Right, exactly. At maybe the day after sentencing, you know, people have been telling them, well, now you have closure. And they've held that grief response on hold during the criminal justice process, like I said, can last anywhere from a year to eight years to a long time. And they have put that grief process on hold. And so then all of a sudden, the trial's over, the person's been sentenced, and what's next? Well, I know what's next for the prosecutor. That's to go get your next case and take your next case to trial. You might give a hug to the victims, but we got to get moving on to the next. And that's where your organization comes in, right? Right. We are there um, with them through the criminal justice process and beyond because we know that it's going to probably be very difficult for them to realize that, yes, you have these intense reactions to deal with even though this process has, has finished. And you also see that a lot of times Families have a lot of support during all of this. Right. And then also when the um, per offender is sentenced, then people go back to their lives. Right. And here you are with your life still in disarray. And it can take a lifetime to learn to cope with that loss. Right. And it might even get you involved in helping other people too. Right, and I think too, one of the things that we tr really work out is bringing survivors together so they know that they're not alone. That peer support is so important because it validates how they're feeling, knowing that they're not going crazy, and that other people have gone through similar um, crimes and have survived. Jenny Willen, thank you so much for the work you do in the community and for appearing here on Prosecutor's Post. Well, thank you again for the invitation. 
and we enjoy working with you, Dan, very much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dan Satterberg. If you'd like to find out more about Jenny's group, Family and Friends of Violent Crime Victims, visit fnfvcv.org. Thank you very much. This has been the Prosecutor's Post.